Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's event. My name is Alec Lee. I'm the co-director uh, for Global Healthcare at Frontier View, a fiscal note company. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Novartis, for making this event possible. Um, and to kick today's event off, I'm joined by Representative uh, Larry Bouchon, cardiothoracic surgeon and member of the Doctors' Caucus. Uh, Congressman, uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. So I'm going to go straight to our questions uh, today, Congressman. So really to get us started, uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about the situation of uh, cardiovascular patients. So we've seen a little bit uh, that uh, the situation even before the pandemic uh, was plateauing in terms of our ability to bring down mortality from cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, we also know that it's uh, from a perspective of prevention that some very simple behavioral changes can reduce uh, prevalence and improve outcomes. So what is it that's really preventing patients from your perspective to have access to preventive care and treatment for cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I think, you know, I think overall over the last number of decades, we've done a, we've done a fair job getting public information out about things like obesity and cigarette smoking um, and poor diets, high cholesterol, things that affect your cardiovascular system. But there's still some resistance to that. Here in the Midwest, we have still have a significant instance of cigarette smoking, obesity. But also, for whatever reason, we've seen the incidence of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and diabetes in general uh, increase over the years. Why that is, I don't know. So, you know, one of the things we don't do that well in the U.S. healthcare system is preventive care. And I think we need to do a better job, uh, both at the state and federal level, of incentivizing uh, preventive care. And a couple ways you can do that, not only information, but you can do things like take away co-pays and deductibles for preventive care um, for people that are, have private insurance or whether they have Medicare, Medicaid, and encourage people to get preventive care. So I think that's where we've kind of plateaued is where the people that are going to get preventive care are and others there's some financial barriers potentially to getting into seeing a physician or a other provider and we need to do better there i think and i think that's our challenge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very interesting so uh, we've uh, let's say already achieved the low-hanging fruit now we need to get to more into the details and understand who's getting left behind uh, from a that's correct care perspective excellent so we've also seen recently, obviously during the pandemic, has really disrupted uh, access for patients in some situations, but it's had a major impact um, on providers. It's, it's been a very challenging time. So considering what you just talked about uh, regarding access to preventive care and obviously treatment for cardiovascular disease, what do you see as the major challenges facing providers, um, specifically physicians, uh, yeah. in this current moment? Well, let me comment on the patients just quickly. We did see a significant downturn of people coming to the emergency room for cardiovascular-related things during the pandemic because of their fear of getting COVID, and that is going to show up in our data coming forward where people uh, just didn't get the, the, the immediate care for acute disease. For cha The challenges for providers uh, are physician burnout. I mean, physician burnout has always been a concern, but it intensified during COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of providers were overworked, had patients, loved ones, who battled the virus, um, some of which passed away. I mean, it's stressful for providers when you have uh, patients, uh, you know, do poorly, particularly during the pandemic. And why, why are we having physician burnout? Well, a number of things are, are challenging physicians. And one of those continues to be the dropping reimbursement and I think the, and the increased cost of medical school and what it takes you to become a doctor. And then on the back end, the reimbursement challenges that we have. So people are not only having uh, challenges uh, because it's a stressful profession, but then they have financial issues, you know, in, in their practices because of uh, dropping reimbursement that's really been plummeting over the last 30 years. Where this has really affected us is in rural America with primary care physicians. I mean, imagine coming out of medical school with $250,000 in debt and trying to practice in a rural family practice uh, situation. I mean, it's just not financially uh, doable. So, uh, I, you know, I think, there's other things that have been uh, challenging over the years, uh, ongoing liability reform that hasn't happened, which puts some some stress on physicians as it relates to their ability to practice without the threat of uh, prevalent lawsuits. Um, but the pandemic really intensified this because mm -hmm. of uh, the, the number of patients and 
um, the whole situation was just a, a dramatic stressor on providers really up and down the board, including physicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very clear, very clear. And coming back to the cardiovascular uh, patients, patients with cardiovascular disease or that might not have access to uh, screenings for cardiovascular disease or access to support uh, with behavioral changes, you can't disconnect one from the other. Um, from what I'm hearing uh, you say, really, that you need access to better preventive care and, and uh, primary yeah. care for these patients, especially in rural America where prevalence of diabetes is going up. Um, but at the same time, you have a struggle uh, from a provider perspective. So you have to address both sides of this challenge, it sounds like. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I mean, we need to figure out, uh, you know, how we can get people through their medical school training or their nurse practitioner training or their nursing school training without this level of debt. Uh, financially, you know, the cost of higher education impacts the medical fields just as much as it does everyone else. And this isn't, of course, just in medicine. It's in a lot of fields. You see kids, young people coming out of college with substantial educational debt. And that's a big challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. How do how do we meet that challenge? I don't know. It's complicated. But, you know, yeah. there are things we can do. There are definitely, then, definitely yeah, options. It's a big challenge. And then on the back end, you, you know, trying to be able to get people to come to rural communities where you don't make as much income versus going to a larger city, maybe being employed by a larger system. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a perfect storm, honestly, here in rural America. Yeah, most definitely. And speaking to rural America, what would you say from a, a provider? So here, hospital networks, uh, payer systems, and think about Medicare and Medicaid, what can be done to facilitate uh, access to uh, support for behavioral changes, looking at those um, uh, behaviors that uh, create greater risk for cardiovascular disease. Are there any actions currently being, being taken in your home state? Well, I mean, you know, if you look at healthcare coverage, for example, we have what's called Healthy Indiana Plan 2.0, which is a uh, HSA-based way to cover the Medicaid population, which has been very successful. So, yes, in the state of Indiana, if you are low income, you can get on Healthy Indiana Plan. It's the state-based Medicaid program. And we insured uh, an additional 400,000 Hoosiers uh, approximately over the last decade with that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, innovative state-based ways to cover people under the Medicaid program. And then our state has promoted that uh, aggressively. So in Indiana, you don't see that many people who are uninsured uh, who don't have access to Medicaid. And a small financial barrier will prevent people from getting preventive care. I mean, it, it's surprising. Uh, it doesn't take, you know, a thousand dollar bill uh, from a hospital to prevent care. People get twenty five, thirty dollar copays and they can't afford that. And they just don't go see a physician. So in Indiana, we've broken that barrier down in the Medicaid space. And uh, I think we're doing pretty well there. And, and uh, there's some other challenges. But, yes, uh, financial barriers need to be addressed. Yes, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And of course, if they don't get access, that preventive care end up with cardiovascular disease. That cardiovascular That's correct. disease progresses. That actually generates more costs uh, for everyone and, and poor outcomes for those patients. So, yep. it, concluding here, thinking about the pandemic, thinking about the challenges that you've laid out for us, are there any key lessons learned? Have we perhaps used technology in different ways or changed the the, the patient the journey? Um, to help them get access in, in innovative ways that could, uh, let's say, help us to overcome some of these barriers as we move forward, thinking about the cardiovascular patients? Absolutely. We learned a lot during the pandemic. Uh, you know, we learned, first of all, that everyone needs to get broadband access in rural America. And why do they need that? Well, they need it for educating their kids, but they need it for telehealth. Telemedicine has been uh, really a godsend to us during the pandemic. And, you know, I think in Congress, we're working in a bipartisan way to make sure the things that the federal government did to facilitate that and the technological advances that facilitated that uh, continue on after the public health emergency uh, ends. And so, yeah, we did learn that. And I think it's uh, technology is critical to the future of healthcare. I do think you're going to be getting a lot of your health care on your phone or your iPad or your computer in the future. Um, and that will increase access, no doubt. And it increases the ability of providers to prov to give information to patients to help them change these lifestyle things that you've pointed out and I've pointed out um, that will improve their risk of cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.
Most definitely, and, and thank you for that uh, very clear uh, response, Congressman. So to finish us up here, we're going to be discussing with an expert panel coming up um, some of these topics, especially uh, population health management, uh, something that yeah. you've really highlighted. I'd like to uh, conclude here by uh, one last question, and you've already laid out some of the policy initiatives that need to be pursued, but what would you say would be the priority in, in the short term from a policy perspective, federal and state, in order for us to start pushing uh, the number back down, to push this trend in a, uh, towards a, a declining direction regarding uh, mortality derived from cardiovascular disease in the United States? Well, at the, at the federal level, you know, we need to address the Medicare program. I mean, uh, Medicare Part A, as you probably know, is uh, financially in trouble. We need to address some reforms there. It's difficult to do. Medicare Advantage plans, the pa patients like them, and that's one avenue to take um, to uh, reform the system. On the Medicaid side, I wish the federal government would allow more states to do things like Indiana did innovatively, like you know, Healthy Indiana Plan, uh, so that we can cover more people, uh, and that way people aren't completely uninsured. And we need to also find ways to decrease deductibles and co-pays in the private insurance marketplace so that people have access. And those are the things that we can be doing and looking forward to. But we need to get the cost of health care down in general. We need more transparency in the system. Um, and we need to address the reasons why health care is so expensive in the first place. All very clear. Um, Congressman, thank you very much uh, for your time and the very enlightening uh, responses to these uh, Challenging questions. Um, yeah. Sounds like we need to bring different stakeholders together and uh, move in the right direction, take advantage of the lessons learned again uh, during the pandemic to overcome some of these barriers. Well, thank you, Congressman Bouchon, for taking the time to speak with me today. Next up, we have uh, the state perspective uh, with uh, Representative Billy Mitchell. Representative Mitchell serves in the Georgia House of Representatives and is the president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislatures. Uh, Representative Mitchell, welcome. Thanks for taking the time. Alec, I'm so glad to be with you, particularly on this topic. This is one that is of great importance to the constituency of our members uh, in the NBCSL. Excellent. So I'm going to start us off uh, with uh, our first question. Um, Representative Mitchell, you've been an advocate for improved access to medicines to combat uh, obesity, particularly obesity being a um, a condition, a, a disease which uh, makes patients uh, more likely to develop uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, now, thinking about this situation, uh, what, uh, what are the key barriers uh, right now um, for patients to get access or obtain medication uh, for their treatments, or excuse, excuse me, um, for obesity? Well, I tell you, that, Alec, there's a, a just a myriad of issues that we're going to have to tackle and address uh, before we can overcome what is uh, a, a, a issue among uh, the constituencies that we serve. I, I will tell you here, uh, very oftentimes uh, in uh, I, schools in my community, and it's amazing to learn and to see how many students go to school, the only balanced meal that they really have is what they receive from school. I, it's, uh, I'd see kids going to school in the morning and their diet consists of uh, Coca-Cola, potato chips or something like that. So that's where it starts. So obviously we've got to do a better job of educating uh, our students, educating even our parents. But this issue, uh, you know, we're talking about in, in the urban communities, 48% of uh, African-American adults suffer uh, from some stage of diabetes. And uh, this is a, a malady that must be addressed. Uh, we're talking about uh, some uh, many families not having access uh, to proper health care. They can't afford it or or, or, or they just uh, in rural areas, they just can't, don't have the access to, to the kind of health professionals that they need to be able to address these kinds of issues. So those are the kinds of things that we as policymakers can address. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that uh, you, you're having this discussion. Uh, no, excellent. Uh, I think that's really clear, very interesting. Um, obviously lack of access to healthy foods, but also the habits and many people just don't know uh, what they may be doing um, by the, the selection of uh, 
of their diet. Um, and that gets me to my next question, which, you know, thinks about the, uh, again, uh, coming back to the idea of population uh, health management. This was a discussion we've had with our other uh, policymakers um, and uh, policy analysts. Do you see that there are specific uh, individuals across communities that uh, are necessary to engage to transmit this message or if something's not getting through? So do we need to do a better job um, in our communication? No question about it. We, we have to do a much better job. We have to come up with uh, better policies. Uh, very often times when we're talking about addressing needs of individuals, uh, sometimes we, we, politics get in the way, uh, which shouldn't be the case. Uh, we have the, uh, who, uh, there's a form of thinking that uh, perhaps the government shouldn't be into social issues like this. And then we have others that believe that the very purpose of government is to be able to help uh, its citizens. Uh, that's why we have this, this long debate going on about expanding Medicaid. We expanded Medicaid. It would address these kinds of issues uh, for those who could not afford it, those who are, don't have health care through some employment and the like. So we do certainly educate our constituencies and educate parents, children, uh, but we have to get that message across to the policymakers as well. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, once we get over the politics of what this is all about and really address the needs of the citizens, we would have a, a healthier community. And I would say, Alec, a healthier community is a safer community. A healthier community is a more viable and vibrant community. A healthy community, uh, education thrives in a healthier community. So it, it would help all of us uh, to, to make certain that we do all that we can to keep our communities healthy. And certainly when it comes to this d disease, the diabetes, which uh, in large measure can be avoided. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And you, you've brought uh, forward the answer to one of my questions was, what's the specific legislative action that can be taken? You already suggested the expansion uh, of Medicaid. And of course, the access to healthcare provision through Medicaid and also communicating, educating around certain behaviors um, or go hand in hand. And so I want to come back to something um, that you've highlighted previously, which is specifically the stigma around uh, treating obesity as an ep epidemic or a disease specifically. Why, why do you think that we still confront this challenge and, and can't uh, address it straight on as uh, the disease that it, it is? Well, the, the, the reality is uh, we have those uh, who, uh, quite, quite frankly, don't believe that the uh, government should be in uh, the, uh, the, the policy making of uh, these kinds of social uh, issues. Uh, and I, I disagree. I, I think that uh, we need to make certain that I think the number one job of government is to protect its citizens. Uh, so we have to do and quite frankly, folks like myself have to do a better job of making certain uh, that uh, those who are in positions to make a difference understand the value of this. And I, and I tell you, the corporate community, you know, we have such great corporations that do such that are in such a great space and being able to create uh, medicinal uh, 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 medicines that be able to treat these kinds of things. And we've got to create a legislative environmental space which gives them the freedom to create and to to build and to 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 uh, make medicines and and and, and policies that to, to mm -hmm. them to be creative so that we can address these kinds of issues. And mm -hmm. if we do that, I, I think that it'd be great. The, you know, even this, this notion of expanding Medicaid, it's good for everyone. If we, we don't spend as much money as we do and, and treating individuals for diabetes, we can perhaps use some of that monies to, to be able to expand other drugs and health care mm -hmm. products deal with other issues. So I think it's 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 a, the circle of life, if you will, Alec. Let's deal with this. Let's promote uh, ways that we can deal with this. Let's try and treat those who have this disease uh, so that they can be healthy. And then we can go on to other things and, and have a more vibrant community, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, looking at the fact that from a cardiovascular disease perspective, we've plateaued or we had pl plateaued 
prior to the pandemic in terms of bringing down uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, and one of the keys identified is that we need to be more focused on uh, getting access to those individuals that are not necessarily uh, getting a preventive care or treatment. So expanding Medicaid uh, is a key to that, as you've laid out. Um, and I think, uh, of course, uh, second of all, is uh, allowing for the value creation uh, through the prevent prevention of some of these conditions, such as uh, diabetes, uh, can be uh, uh, stimulated um, in the right way through the right reimbursement uh, mechanisms uh, so that we're able to generate uh, value for uh, the communities and individuals, as you so um, insightfully mentioned, the, the value of uh, healthy uh, societies, healthy communities extends uh, to many, many levels that uh, oftentimes goes unnoticed. So thank you very much um, for your time. I think very, very clear. Um, and uh, we uh, wish you luck uh, in your in your efforts. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Alec, I'm so glad to be with you, and I hope in future conversations we can talk about the progress we've made to addressing this malady. Thank you so very much. Next up, we have Dr. David Nash, founding Dean Emeritus, Jefferson College of Public Health, speaking with Dr. Vas Narasimhan, CEO of Novartis. Thank you, Alec. I really appreciate the chance to be here today with uh, the fearless leader, CEO of Novartis, Voss. Uh, great to be together. Uh, I'm in Philadelphia, you're in Basel, so that's the only good part of the pandemic. You could make these kinds of programs happen. So thank you for carving out time. I really appreciate it. So well, we're, Wonderful to be here with you, David. Thank thanks. You. We're going to talk a little bit about the burden of cardiovascular disease worldwide, all the way to the United States and all the way here to the great city, founding city of our country, Philadelphia. So Vas, look, uh, even at the height of the pandemic, uh, cardiovascular disease death still is uh, our number one killer. Uh, how could that be after all the work, Novartis, Jefferson, uh, literally half a million doctors in the United States focused on reducing hypertension, reducing cholesterol, know your numbers, follow the guidelines. I'm tired just thinking about it. Uh, you know, we should have done better. So maybe you could help us from your perch on top of this amazing global company focused on reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease. How do we get into the jam that we find ourselves David, it's an it's a important question, and I think one that doesn't, have, of course, have, have an easy answer. Um, I certainly bring the perspective of a company that has been working cardiovascular disease now for over 50 years in many of the areas that you mentioned, whether it's hypertension or heart failure or lowering, uh, lowering lipids. And I think what we've seen on the one hand with these new therapeutic options, improved diagnosis, the incredible efforts of physicians and nurses across the U.S., pretty important improvements that we had for a number of, of decades. And then recently, really over the last 10 years, we've seen a flattening of the gains uh, against cardiovascular disease. And now we're on a pace to perhaps reach 1 million deaths uh, annually by 2030 for cardiovascular disease, which I think is not what, what we would like to see. I think a few, few factors, I think certainly our ability to mobilize communities to really ensure that there's a high degree of, of awareness so we have appropriate diagnostic measures so people are identified. We know areas like hypertension and primary hyperlipidemia are vastly underdiagnosed. So one big challenge. The second, as you know well, keeping patients on their medicines is extremely yeah. difficult. And I think having new approaches, population health-based approaches, that can get people to stay on medicine longer, but that's when we really get the benefits are gonna be you know, super important. Uh, and I think those are some of the trends we're gonna really need to tackle. I was heartened to see some of the guidelines get tighter now on the hyperlipidemia, more aggressive approaches on hypertension, but, but clearly we need to now get to another level if we're gonna tackle this and really get to healthy 2030. I mean, is that kind of what you, you see as well? You bet, and uh, healthy, uh, you know, the 2030 guidelines, they're pretty tough. And as a primary care internist, I mean, especially in the last 35 years of tackling this, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I've come around to really understanding that 
Sure, it's compliance and adherence. You're absolutely right. And the new technologies, new drugs, new approaches. But you've written about the syndemic, right? The convergence of all these forces. So tell me more about that, because I think it's the social determinants, especially in the United States, that are driving uh, the increase in death from cardiovascular disease. Yeah, David, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the syndemic really hit us with uh, the, the pandemic, where we saw that alongside uh, the surge in COVID-19 hospitalizations, we also saw a pretty big decrease in non-communicable disease visits, particularly in communities of color and in lower socioeconomic communities. Um, and that, I think, highlighted something that was there all along, that we know that uh, no matter which factor you look at, we see higher incidences of various cardiovascular disease risk factors in these communities. And we just haven't done enough to really improve the quality of care, to really ensure these communities understand the risks, get the appropriate care, and then hopefully get the, the right interventions. And as you rightfully say, it's multifactorial. It's not just medicines. It's the food. It's the activity. It's the public health measures. And when that gets in the wrong cycle, um, it can really lead to an acceleration of cardiovascular disease. I'm sure you see that in, in Philadelphia. Well, you're right, Voss. You know, this town where I've had the privilege of uh, working at Jefferson for the last 32 years, you know, it's a complicated. So we're the nation's fourth or fifth largest city by population, depending on whether you're speaking to people in Houston and Phoenix. But we'll call it number five. <laughs> And uh, with that, we have one quarter of our almost 5 million people living in poverty. And poverty seems to be the biggest predictor out there that we know about. Uh, that means if you're poor, sadly, in America, you're in poor health. So uh, I'm excited about the joint venture we have between Jefferson and Novartis you know, some would say unlikely bedfellows, but I would argue it's exactly the kind of new partnerships we're going to need for the future. And in that program, Closing the Gap, as you know, we're trying to tackle these really gripping social determinants of health, poverty, crime, lack of education that you noted in a city that one quarter of the people live in poverty and 54% of the population is of color. So when you dive deep into the five zip codes that we are working on with your team from Novartis, what have we found? Well, we have found structural barriers. Uh, let's just name a couple of them, right? Uh, people are afraid to go outside to exercise because of crime. People can't afford healthy food. There isn't even any healthy food to buy in the five zip codes where the 200,000 folks that we're working with live. So these are not problems you can, you know, snap your fingers, give them a new drug and say, okay, we beat cardiovascular disease. We need a community level partnership, education, boots on the ground, community health workers. So to have an academic medical center and a global pharma recognize these realities and work together, boy, that's really exciting. And I think it nicely addresses the syndemic that you've written about and the work you've got elsewhere. But, you know, Novartis is global. So tell us in the closing here, you've got stuff like this going on all over the world. I'm sure our listeners would like to hear more. You know, there are many of the factors that you, you discussed, and by the way, we're so proud to work with Jefferson on the, on the project we're working on together. It's our first real big alliance. We hope to launch many others across the U.S., but really a pioneering a partnership. So really excited to tackle these challenges in the city of Philadelphia, which I also grew up near. So uh, I definitely uh, want to see us improve, improve life for the citizens of Philly. Um, you know, around the world, we know cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death and disability on the planet. I mean, if you look at the scale of the impact, potentially 18 million people die a year for cardiovascular disease, many of them far too young. Um, and, and we don't see those trends improving for many of the same reasons that we've talked about. Certainly poverty, uh, uh, the ability to access strong public health services, clinical services, 
has led to this really, I mean, it's an epidemic of cardiovascular disease um, around the world. But we are seeing, uh, I think, pockets of real hope to really tackle this from a population health uh, approach. I'll give you a few examples. We've had the opportunity to work with three cities in trying to reduce hypertension at scale. We've worked with uh, the city of Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Accra in Ghana, and Sao Paulo in Brazil, all with the goal of saying, can you take a population health-based screening approach to really tackle hypertension? More recently, we've been now looking at hyperlipidemia. We launched a major partnership with the NHS in the UK for the entire country to again say, can we improve diagnostic and treatment rates for hyperlipidemia, knowing that only 20% of patients with heart disease take their medicines and get their lipids down below 70 milligrams per DL, which is where we want them to be. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity. And now we're excited because we see opportunities in many other countries now thinking about how do you tackle cardiovascular health at scale? And how do we really take this from a, a population health-based approach? And that's a paradigm shift, as you know, going away from saying, let's take this one patient at a time, which we also need to do, but also saying, how can an entire system prioritize cardiovascular disease? So I think it's exciting. It's going to take a long time, of course, to get the movement moving. But the hope is we can really make a dent on the leading cause of death and disability in the world. Well, that, that's really a fantastic global track record. And I hope there's lessons we could learn from Mongolia Ghana and the NHS and bring some of those learnings right here to Philadelphia in closing the gap. I, I bet there's plenty we could learn. Well, Voss, you know, the other thing we're trying to do is uh, form other partnerships, talking to other companies, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, uh, all kinds of people who maybe if we could tackle the food and we need the better internet connectivity, and we recognize that just keeping the, the wealthy healthy isn't really the answer. We, we got to get to people where they live and work and get food to them and do it right and education and community health workers. It's a big job, but there's a lot we could learn what you've accomplished with your teams all over the world. And uh, I think we recognize that while creating new products, obviously very, very important, uh, getting folks, getting these products to the right people, compliance, adherence, and tackling those social determinants, as we've come to call them. That's really what the future is all about. Well, you must be proud of your team, Voss, all over the world. That's a fantastic company. I am very grateful speaking for our team at Jefferson. And I know that Dr. Steve Clasco, our former CEO, if it wasn't for his conversations with you and others, uh, we wouldn't be able to have this great program, Closing the Gap, and my colleagues like Dr. Sandra Brooks and the whole team at the Philadelphia Collaborative for Health Equity. Uh, she's leading the ground attack in these uh, five zip codes. So what a real privilege for me, uh, after 32 years on the faculty here, to finally be engaged at the ground level. You know, uh, we didn't learn any of this in medical school 40 years ago, I can tell you that. But I'm happy that we're teaching these kinds of things now at Sydney Kimmel Medical College and in the Jefferson College of Population Health. So, Vas, thanks again for giving us your global insights. It'd be great to be a part of this awesome program. Alec, back to you, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Nash. Next, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to hear about recent trends, key access barriers, and health inequity within cardiovascular disease, and how we can leverage population health approaches to reduce its morbidity and mortality. With that said, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we have Sukhu, uh, the CEO of Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mark McClellan, who is the professor and founding director at uh, Duke uh, Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anand Parekh, uh, the chief medical advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And uh, finally, Dr. Richard Allen Williams, the president and CEO of the Minority Health Institute and clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, as well as 117th president of the National Medical Association. Um, welcome to everyone uh, on our panel. It's very good to have you here today. So 
With that said, uh, first of all, uh, this with this uh, great panel, I'd love to have uh, 30 minutes to speak with each of you in depth. You all bring a lot to the table and have very interesting um, uh, ideas to bring to this conversation. Uh, with that said, I'd like to start us off with a little bit of uh, context. So uh, turning over to Dr. Parak, uh, uh, we saw that uh, uh, Voss in a previous conversation mentioned that uh, even prior to the pandemic, we had uh, begun to see a plateauing of the improvements and outcomes for cardiovascular disease patients. Can you talk us a little bit through the uh, epidemiological uh, situation of uh, cardiovascular disease in the United States prior to the pandemic um, and a little bit of what we've seen during the pandemic? Sure, thank you for hosting this important discussion. Obviously uh, a critical topic because cardiovascular deaths remain the leading cause of death in the United States. One of the things we saw in the decade prior to the pandemic, so 2010 to 2019, was that U.S. life expectancy stagnated. Now, a critical factor for that stagnation was the plateauing in the decline in mortality rates from cardiovascular disease. And this is just because we haven't done as well as we need to in terms of controlling conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and addressing the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as poor nutrition, lack of physical activity. Cigarette smoking is probably the one area where we've seen consistent declines in prevalence Recently, though, it remains to be seen whether the pandemic disrupted that trend. Another tragic aspect of this is that there's been significant geographic variation. The CDC has analyzed this variation to look at what's called potentially preventable deaths in the United States and has estimated approximately 100,000 potentially preventable deaths from heart disease and 20,000 potentially preventable deaths from stroke annually. Now, the pandemic further exacerbated this situation as 2020 saw deaths related to cardiovascular disease increase and disproportionately affect Black, Hispanic, and Asian adults. And this is likely due to the foregoing of care, uh, both of diagnosis and disease management, but also the foregoing of care of, um, of acute episodes as well. Mm -hmm. It's also important to note the impact of cardiovascular disease on COVID-19. A recent study in the Journal of the American Heart Association showed that two-thirds of COVID-19 hospitalizations, two thirds were attributable to one of four conditions, heart failure, hypertension, obesity, or diabetes. So I think all of these data points really demonstrate both the direct as well as the indirect impact of cardiovascular disease on our nation's health prior to and during the pandemic. Yes, indeed. And that's uh, very well laid out, very clear and highlights uh, the importance of this conversation and uh, continued action um, to put us back on the trajectory of uh, decline um, in the uh, incidence, but also mortality uh, related to cardiovascular disease. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parak. Uh, I'd now like to uh, understand, Dr. Parak has put some interesting uh, ideas on the table here for us, uh, especially related to patient access to uh, prevention and uh, treatment. So. To bring a little bit of light into why this might be taking place, uh, Sue, could you speak to us a little bit about what your uh, nurses um, might have uh, might have seen or might have uh, told you about uh, the key barriers that uh, patients face in accessing uh, necessary uh, prevention services and, and treatment for cardiovascular disease? Yes, and thank you, Dr. Perrick. I think you laid that out very nicely. We. I mean, obviously, we've seen a lot in terms of um, social determinants of health just being a major factor in access to preventive care and treatment. Um, when we talk about social determinants of health, we're looking at income, you know, education level, access to transportation is a huge issue, race. Um, Dr. Perrick already mentioned uh, geographic location, but also really just lack of sort of awareness of preventive services that are available. Yeah, no, excellent. That's um, that's very clear, and I think really bringing the, these points together is going to help take us into that conversation of so what what is it that we can do? Um, and I think that there's a lot there. But before transitioning, um, I'd actually I'd like to come back uh, to uh, the point of the inequities um, related to access uh, and to some of the 
uh, let's say, uh, predetermined um, uh, rates, the uh, incidents, uh, incident rates that we're seeing across different populations. Dr. Williams, uh, you've spent a, a career looking at uh, inequities within healthcare um, uh, service delivery and access. Can you speak to us a little bit of what you've seen um, for cardiovascular disease uh, amongst uh, different populations um, and uh, maybe a little bit of what's been done to date? Thank you, yes. I'd like to uh, weigh in and put a little, uh, I guess you might say, color or complexion in the, into the conversation uh, regarding the impact that uh, all of these uh, problems have. Uh, we can talk about uh, things that are occurring across the nation, but unless we address the particular aspects of the impact of uh, inequities on uh, specific populations like uh, Blacks and Latinos, et cetera, not uh, really addressing it uh, honestly and directly. I'd like to mention uh, also that uh, unless we recognize the fact that there is an underlying uh, aspect of racism to all of what we're doing or what we're looking at, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to recognize the fact that racism is really at really at the crux and at the basis of all of uh, the inequities that are occurring. Uh, there is not really anything uh, such as health inequity that exists today and never has been. What we need to do is to move on to feeding. In regards to cardiovascular disease in particular, I can uh, speak from experience that I've had over the last 50 years in regards to the uh, inequities that have occurred in that area. I'm not permitted to go into great detail on that, but suffice it to say that there has been no equality or equity regarding either the dispensation of health care uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint or the recognition of the importance of different uh, manifestations of cardiovascular disease by race and ethnicity. This needs to change. And uh, in the creation of the program where we're going to be discussing some of the things that are changing, I'd like to uh, point out some aspects of that, that are occurring. But finally, I'd like to say that uh, many years ago, uh, Dr. David Satcher, when he was attorney, I'm sorry, a Surgeon General of the United States, uh, wrote a book uh, about healthcare disparities and differences in healthcare delivery. And he pointed out the fact that if we were equal, uh, we would be able to save the lives of a number of people. He estimated at that time that at least 80,000 lives per year would be saved if there was equity if we, equality in healthcare delivery. That number has ramped up into the hundreds of thousands now. And I'd like for folks to keep that in mind in regards to what we can truly accomplish from a life state saving standpoint if we do achieve equity in uh, healthcare delivery and specifically in cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Williams. And so I think a key message um, there and going back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Parak has uh, laid out for us is specifically that just by uh, more deeply addressing um, the social determinants of uh, health outcomes, we can go a long ways into uh, once again heading towards a, a declining rate of uh, morbidity and mortality for cardiovascular disease within the United States. So that's going to be really important to keep um, in focus as we move to the next part of this conversation, which is what can we do? So what what really comes next? And there's been a lot of talk around here, and we've already discussed on many instances that we know what the uh, key uh, risk factors are for cardiovascular disease. We know how to manage in many instances cardiovascular disease, and therefore a key component of uh, going back this declining uh, these declining trends in uh, morbidity and mortality 
is going to be improved uh, population health management. And so I'd like to turn to Dr. McClellan here. And Dr. McClellan, can you just start us off with a, a, a definition, explanation of what is population health management? Uh, sure, Alec, and great to be with this panel on such an important topic where we've got, you know, better medicines than ever before. But as you said, the trends are going in the wrong direction and we're worsening um, the trends with re respect to equity, as Dr. Williams just eloquently stated. Population health is really intended to address that. This is the notion of having a systematic strategy to improve important health outcomes for a defined population of patients. And that means focusing first and foremost intentionality around understanding where the gaps are in population health and then understanding what the steps and interventions are that could achieve the greatest improvements uh, in those outcomes and, and hopefully save money at the same time by preventing the costly complications as, uh, as uh, Ananda uh, talked about, the, um, the um, uh, leading causes of hospitalizations and therefore hospital costs are these cardiovascular diagnoses. So what does this look like um, that's different from kind of traditional health healthcare? Well, it starts with good data to understand the, the population that you're trying to serve. Uh, how are they doing? Uh, what are their unmet needs? Uh, what kinds of uh, characteristics they have that would predict that they are facing cardiovascular risk factors that are not controlled, continuing to smoke, uh, not being diagnosed with high blood pressure or diabetes, uh, not being, uh, not having access to medications and, and regular use of medications that could control those conditions. And that, by the way, is most people uh, in the American population disproportionately, including racial and ethnic uh, minority groups, and then what are the targeted interventions that can be effective uh, for those populations? And it really depends. You know, for some patients, it may be co-pays, although we have a lot of generic drugs that are free or inexpensive on good health insurance plans or, or Medicaid, uh, they're still often not used. So there are other factors as well. Uh, this may include awareness and trust, as, uh, as we heard about earlier. It may also include many of these social factors that are so important in uh, determining health, uh, lack of transportation, housing and nutrition issues. You know, it's hard to remember to focus on taking your medications or modifying your, your, your diet and lifestyle. If you don't have enough to eat, you don't have a reliable place to, to live. Uh, so lots of social determinants that could matter. And it's finding the interventions that, that can influence that. That can be instead of waiting for people to come into an office visit that they may not have easy access to or the time or ability to fend into their stressful lives, especially during a pandemic, taking the care to them community health workers, um, reliance on different kinds of telehealth and remote monitoring, uh, using data to identify people who are having trouble filling their prescriptions once they've been diagnosed and reaching out to them maybe with a pharmacist help or a social worker help or something like that. And it means special attention to populations that have been disadvantaged. So tracking race, ethnicity, language, and seeing how you're doing in terms of reducing those disparities having explicit strategy, uh, intentionality to address all of this. And the thing that I emphasize, Alec, is that just about everything that I described is not reimbursed well, if at all, under our traditional way of fee-for-service payments in healthcare. There you get payments when you come into the office for a visit. Those payments have been squeezed down and doctors have very little time to do more than just remind you, hey, you've got risk factors. You should take this medication. That's not a, a population health strategy. And then a lot of the money going into the emergency room visits, those costly complications from failing in population health as we're doing uh, so frequently in this country, especially in the pandemic. We've seen tons of efforts to try to address this. Uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues who are in primary care cardiology uh, trying to take steps despite the lack of financial alignment to put in place, you know, longitudinal data tracking or to set up pilot programs to reach out to communities that are underserved. Um, but those are really hard to sustain, let alone scale, mm -hmm. if the finances aren't aligned. So mm -hmm. we really need here to make these models work is a different way of paying for healthcare that's aligned with better outcomes at the population level. That's something more like 
per member per month payments, like you see in some of the accountable care organizations or mm -hmm. some of the direct contracting models mm -hmm. with accountability, not for did you have an office visit, but did you actually make progress on resolving these health mm -hmm. disparities and these huge gaps in population health? Perfect. Perfect. It, it, very, very clear. It's a great definition for us to, to work from. Um, and you've laid out already a couple of the key barriers, which I think you contextualize is the lack of scale or the ability to achieve scale, which comes back to reimbursement models and incentive structures. So I want to come back to that idea um, and also look at how that impacts the, uh, the inequities that exist and, and how we can address the social determinants of, of these outcomes for cardiovascular disease patients. But before doing so, I want to go back to Dr. Parak and uh, Dr. Can, can you elaborate perhaps on, uh, we've seen that Dr. McClellan has broadly spoken about the challenges that we need to address. Can you ground this in some maybe specific examples, uh, whether successful or not, of how uh, we've seen a partnerships uh, to advance population health management in the context of cardiovascular disease? Sure, and I'll just echo um, everything that Dr. McClellan said, who he's really the national expert in value-based healthcare transformation. Um, I think quality metrics are the currency for that. Um, and so I think we need cardiovascular disease metrics prioritized. Uh, and in addition, they need to be not just process or screening measures, but they need to be outcome measures. So for example, control of high blood pressure, control of diabetes, smoking cessation. So I think Dr. McClellan's exactly right that that payment reform um, is critical to, to making progress. I also agree that, that we need to embrace new models like team-based care. I think empowering pharmacists is an excellent example. Uh, and, and their ability to engage in cardiovascular disease prevention and control. And, and I agree that for a lot of common cardiovascular conditions, uh, the medications that people need uh, for prevention and management are generic. So there's tremendous opportunity there. And I think we need more innovative public-private sector partnerships. You know, one that I'm familiar with is the Million Hearts campaign. So Million Hearts 2027 is a national initiative to prevent a million heart attacks and strokes within five years using population health and clinical strategies focused on the ABCs, um, better use of aspirin, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, smoking cessation, cardiac rehabilitation. So I think we need some common goals, public and private sector working together, value-based healthcare transformation, uh, new models. I think all of those, uh, those elements uh, could help us here. Mm, perfect. And I imagine that you know, there's there's not a one size fits all solution that needs to be community based or varies state by state um, and looking at the exact situation that we're seeing um, on the ground. So, Sue, I want to come back to you. And uh, Dr. Parak has said something interesting here about uh, the role of uh, different uh, team members in the care delivery for uh, page cardiovascular disease patients and specifically bring a, a pharmacist and the, the role of pharmacy into prevention. So coming back to this concept of, uh, say, population uh, uh, health management, are there examples that you could bring to the table that you've seen? Um, and perhaps do you see a greater role for uh, the nursing community in participating in uh, prevention and, and influencing behaviors of patients? I do. I, I mean, I think that's one of the solutions we really need to look at, and that is to um, you know, really look at team-based care and make sure that um, at the state level, our practitioners are able to practice to their full scope of education, not just be limited by state licensure. So in many of these, you know, difficult areas, rural areas where they, where um, some populations do not have access to care or immediate care, uh, we could have nurse practitioners who could be practicing independently um, or, you know, in conjunction with a medical center that's maybe a certain distance away where right now they're not able to do that. Um, certainly, I know the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, which is a great partner in this area as well, has been doing a lot of work in terms of making sure pharmacists can practice to their full scope as well. And so I think this is um, a great example of a potential solution to some of the issues that we're having. Yeah, that's, that's that's very clear. It actually comes back to a comment earlier in the day from 
uh, Representative Bouchon from Indiana, who mentioned the, the, the dearth or lack of uh, primary care physicians in rural areas to help influence uh, outcomes for uh, those patients. And so finishing up on, on this, I actually, I want to come back to, to you, Dr. Williams. Um, from everything that's been stated in terms of the, the opportunities and uh, challenges for leveraging population-based health, um, do you, what, what, what do you think the key challenges uh, are for um, the, the African-American community uh, to help uh, really uh, influence behaviors and, and start from a prevention standpoint um, before you have to start thinking about uh, treatment? Well, I think that uh, the entire population is challenged to eliminate racism. I want to come back to that. That's a very important component of all of everything that we're talking about. Um, and I'd like to uh, emphasize the, uh, the importance of a recent uh, publication uh, in healthcare. I'm sorry, Health Affairs, uh, just last week, which addressed the, the problem of racism in healthcare. Uh, I hope that uh, many of us will get a chance to access that because it goes into some of the details in regards to exactly what you're asking about, what all of us need to do to address these inequities, not only the African American population, but the entire population. Yeah, no, perfect. And so, uh, again, I think uh, coming back to these solutions and challenges uh, and, and summarizing, it is the willingness and openness to uh, identify and work on social determinants um, of the, the health outcomes that we're seeing across the board. Um, so transitioning, and I'd like to ground this again into concrete next steps. So really the question is from a policy perspective, um, or actions from a, a provider and uh, payer angle, um, or even we can bring in what is it to possible for uh, the industry and the suppliers to bring to the table to advance on some of these challenges that you guys have so eloquently laid out. What What is the, the immediate next step that needs to be taken? So, Dr. McClellan, I'd actually like to come back to you to, to begin. What would you say is the, the really the the, the, the first thing that comes to your mind. Well, we'll talk about two, um, Alec. One is steps that payers in our country can take to move away from models that are clearly not working uh, to address the cardiovascular worrisome trends around uh, re reductions in um, uh, uh, rates of control of risk factors, increasing mortality rates, particularly for uh, lesser served populations, racial and ethnic minorities and others, um, the, and lower income and uh, less educated individuals. These are really worrisome trends that existed to some extent before the pandemic and they've gotten worse. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the, the biggest funder in the country for healthcare across Medicare and Medicaid, has made as their top priority, one of their top priorities, using these population-focused models, uh, getting everyone in Medicare and Medicaid into a care system, one that's not just about visits, but one that anticipates and helps them address their needs. And that takes moving away from fee-for-service payment. Fortunately, we've got lots of good examples of this in Medicare, in Medicaid, in uh, many employer plans that are starting to do this. J.P. Morgan Health has adopted this kind of model. So we need to expand those. And that needs to include, to, to Dr. Williams' point, uh, racism is going to be really hard. It's a deep problem to address. But we can start measuring these disparities, and we can start holding people accountable in these care reforms for reducing them. It's a start. It doesn't do everything, but it's a start. Um, second, we need to change the way that we pay for prescription drugs in this space. Uh, there, we've seen a slowdown in biomedical innovation and cardiovascular drugs, and we're kind of at a, at a loggerheads right now, where on the one hand, uh, there are new treatments and existing treatments that could work really well, but when a new medication comes along and it has a very high price, the health plans understandably say, well, you know, you could try all these other steps first uh, to try to get the patient's risk factors addressed before going to the expensive new medication. The problem is that those steps 
have not really worked. So I'd like to see more of the drug manufacturers aligned with these payment reforms and these support for population health. And you could do that by changing the way that we pay for drugs to make it more about paying at the per population level, a per member per month payment that maybe gets bigger for a drug if it contributes to improvements in these key outcomes that, that uh, Dr. Parekh was emphasizing that ought to be the goals of our cardiovascular treatment and care programs. It ought to be all about population health. And I'd like to see our uh, providers supported more in this way and our drug manufacturers doing more to align with these goals. Mm, that's that's all uh, very clear in, in your suggestions. Again, going back to aligning the incentives, we need to be uh, more and more targeted to, we, we might have picked off the low hanging fruit uh, previously, shifting incentives in order to, to drive the focus um, even more narrowly. So with that, uh, Dr. Parekh, uh, with the same question, what maybe perhaps from the, the federal perspective, what do you see as the top policy action uh, that can be taken so that we can continue to advance in improving the outcomes of cardiovascular disease patients? Well, I think there are a number of federal agencies that are critical. Dr. McClellan mentioned CMS, um, CDC's Division for Heart Disease, Stroke Prevention, NIH's NHLBI, Institute, uh, they all have critical roles. I, I want to maybe just spend one minute on, on the FDA because I think they have um, some unique regulatory tools. Um, just as an example, recently FDA uh, set forth voluntary sodium reduction goals for the nation to reduce average daily adult consumption from 3,400 milligrams daily to 3,000 milligrams daily over the next couple of years. And modeling suggests that if that, if that occurred, uh, and then over 10 years, if we got down to 2,300 milligrams daily, which is the overarching recommendation, uh, that over 20 years, 450,000 cases of cardiovascular disease could be prevented, resulting in cost savings of approximately $40 billion. So that's just sort of one example. Uh, the recent revision in the nutrition facts label now includes added sugars information. Another modeling su study suggested that over the next 20 years, because of that, there will be millions of fewer cases of heart disease and diabetes resulting in billions of dollars of healthcare savings. So I think those are just examples of some of the things FDA can do. Obviously, FDA also has their tobacco control and prevention work where they have a robust agenda there. Tobacco control and prevention also plays a critical role in cardiovascular disease reduction. So, um, you know, all of these activities at the federal level, certainly they're only one stakeholder. You really need all sectors of society role it rowing in the same direction, but certainly federal uh, federal level activities have the, the potential to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in this country. Yeah, very clear, very clear. And you've mentioned uh, the ability to impact uh, the, the cost of healthcare through these actions. And I just wanted to highlight that obviously cost is um, an important and complex uh, component, um, but I'm sure when you, you're speaking about cost, you're also speaking about uh, the economic impact of these communities from lost ability to work, uh, be productive, um, and also going even into uh, the impact for different caretakers. Um, so this really gets to be important, especially when we connect this back to the social determinants of uh, health outcomes. So with that said, uh, you know, I want to leave the last couple of minutes here for Sue and Dr. Williams. Uh, to answer the same question. So Sue, I'll go with you and then Dr. Williams, uh, we can uh, finish today's session uh, uh, with, a, with the, your opinion. But uh, Sue, same question. Uh, from a policy perspective or from a payer provider perspective, what do you see as the top action that should be taken? Yeah, I think, you know, we've had an extensive conversation today about uh, addressing social determinants of health and, you know, just the importance of um, going to legislators to talk about health inequities. And so from an organizational standpoint, I mean, we really need to increase collaboration. We need to activate our members so that the, we can empower them to go and speak to legislators and really help them to understand the inequities that are out there and to ensure uh, legislation that will help to um, bring greater equality. So one of the things I think that was mentioned already that's really important too is uh, we really need to address affordability and access um, to guideline approved innovative medicines. Uh, we're having some challenges in terms of onerous prior authorizations, non-medical switching, 
Um, and certainly patients are facing issues with copay accumulators. So I think there's a lot of work that we could do um, together in collaboration, and it's important that we're working together across organizations and across professions. Mm, yeah, no, very, very clear. Um, and that to bring up the, the some of these issues that I don't think are very clear for a lot of people that are obviously going to influence uh, where the, the the priorities are for uh, the our, our legislators. So, Dr. Williams, I'd like to conclude with you. Um, from your perspective, you know, what is the top action we can take today again to to put that uh, trend line back um, on a declining path? Well, I'd like to join together uh, many of the things that have already been said and uh, weigh in on on them. I can't uh, do it in great detail, but let me just say that coming back to the question about cardiovascular disease and what we can do to impact that. Uh, we need to recognize the fact that traditional risk factors really account for only about 40% of the uh, events, the cardiovascular events that occur, uh, about, well, 60% of uh, the causation, so to speak, can be attributed to uh, what we call social determinants of health, uh, non-traditional risk factors. And we need to look more at that aspect of things. Um, if I may, I'd like to mention, mention one other thing, uh, which is very specific regarding what can be done and refer to a template which has been established at the Mass General Brigham uh, Hospital System regarding uh, uh, approaching uh, institutional racism and uh, rooting that out, I don't want to uh, weigh too heavily on that, but it is extremely important to keep in mind. And they have established a program which uh, is called uh, Again, uh, United Against Racism Initiative, which is funded, uh, very, very well funded at $40 million a year in that hospital system to attack uh, the uh, racism which they uh, have uh, acknowledged uh, is rooted in their, has been rooted in their hospital system, and they are intending to get it out. Uh, they're trying to do all of those things that Dr. McClellan and Dr. Parrick have mentioned need to be done, uh, to, and also uh, uh, Sue, uh, need to be done to address this problem. And I uh, encourage uh, other systems to take a look at what is being done at Mass General Brigham to uh, address this overwhelming uh, problem of institutional racism and the impact that it has on our uh, attempts to achieve equity in healthcare. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for bringing that uh, example to the table. And I'd like to thank all of you, Dr. Potter, Dr. McClellan, Sue and Dr. Williams uh, for your time today. I think you've left us with a lot of food for thought and there's uh, quite a few actions uh, to be taken, uh, again, to, to put um, the, the trim line back on a, a downward uh, trajectory. So thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure sharing this uh, space with you. Next, I am joined by Selena Gore, uh, CEO of Woman Heart. A Woman Heart is the first and only national patient-centered organization dedicated to serving women with heart disease. Uh, Selena has joined us to share her perspective on the needs of cardiovascular disease patients uh, in this moment. Uh, welcome, Selena. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. Excellent. So we've had some uh, very interesting conversations uh, so far, speaking to uh, the a plateauing of the improvement in outcomes for cardiovascular disease patients that we saw prior to the pandemic, a little bit of what we've seen during the pandemic, uh, the impacts uh, across uh, different populations. Um, and there's some key words that keep coming up. So we've seen a, a lot about patient fear during the pandemic to accessing a preventive care or even treatment, um, a lot of access barriers uh, that patients uh, face uh, to getting uh, what they need in order to improve their own outcomes. Personal health management um, has come up and also uh, adherence as a, as a key uh, component of the equation. So from your perspective, Selena, how do patients uh, see this process and really what is the patient experience um, when it comes to 
is preventing and treating cardiovascular disease? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing I would do is turn these concepts or issues, identified issues around and speak about them directly from, from the patient view. Um, because for example, if you take the first, the first topic of patient fear, I would turn that around and say that what, how you can sort of reframe that is to talk about the lack of support and advocates. Um, being alone in your heart journey, I think, is probably one of the most important elements of what might be called patient fear. Mm. If you have support, peer support, um, a health advocate support in the in the in the hospital setting, all of that goes a long way towards sort of mitigating that fear. You know, mm. one really um, important example that st stays with me um, is I was in Kansas City with some of our um, women heart champions who are our volunteers and women who've gone through th th themselves a life-changing heart event. Um, and we went to visit a patient who was getting prepped for surgery and she was, you know, beyond consolable. She was really afraid about the surgery. She thought she was going to die. And our champion sat down with her and was able to say to her, 10 years ago, sitting in the exact same location um, that, that you were. And now 10 years later, I am here not just surviving, but helping other women just like you and just like me, just like us. Um, and that I saw that fundamentally change her view of what she was about to undergo. So I think this support is is really critical in tackling the notion that patients have fear in, in doing any of it, these things that are going to help them. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. And there's obviously within that a lot of actions that can be taken from payers and providers to make sure that those patients are getting that access uh, to basic supports and therefore overcoming the barriers to the hesitancy that exists. So understanding it from a patient perspective um, can go a long ways and, of course, improve the outcomes and, and reduce the cost um, for everyone. Looking at those other uh, personal health management um, and adherence, are those words terminology that really resonate with patients or how would you take what what what, what perspective uh, would you give from the, the the patient angle uh regarding these uh, these keys to improved outcomes yeah it, thanks for thanks for that alec i think i think what is you know important to, to know is that these sound very clinical and so from a patient perspective they it sounds like they're being talked about as opposed to being talked with and so let's take what you said, just said about personal health man management. We probably, many of us belong to hospital systems or health systems now with online medical record systems that we can access ourselves. We can input, you know, the drugs we're taking and, and the appointments we're about to have. So there is a mechanism to help us manage our health. Um, and what I found having personally now logged into these systems a number of times is there's zero training. You get a login and that's it. But if, if there is, if there is a way that they can facilitate an understanding of how to use these systems better in multiple languages, a webinar introduction, even if they want to tape it, that, that will go a long way towards not just better use of the system that helps then helps the system but also better um, health management, personal health management for the patient themselves. So that's that's one really, I think, re really big key that, you know, we've got these systems, great systems, and I want to congratulate the, the health systems for having them, but we don't have training to use these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you said something really interesting there, which is the patients feel talked about instead of talked with. And it comes back to uh, the concept of uh, population health management. Uh, the population is made up of individuals. Um, and effectively, the, the concept is the right one. It's the implementation that we have to look at, uh, which is, is obviously going to be challenging. But uh, earlier today, we spoke with the Congressman Bouchon from Indiana, and he made an interesting comment, which is uh, perhaps one of the reasons that we've seen the plateauing uh, decline um, or the plateauing in the decline of uh, uh, mortality for cardiovascular patients 
is due to uh, the fact that we're unable to uh, go deeper into the patients that we're reaching. In other words, we've we've reached the easy to reach patients. Yes. Um, so with that said, you know, how how what other actions can be taken uh, in order to reach out to those patients that, again, maybe uh, are, for whatever reason, um, struggling to get the preventive care and treatment that they need for their cardiovascular disease? I think, Alec, this is, this is a place where innovation, or at least moving outside of, you know, our, our usual way of doing business is really critical. Mm-hmm. They're not hard to find. They're there. They're everywhere. We're everywhere these communities that they deem to be difficult to treat or difficult to find. It's just that they receive information and communication in a different way. And among, you know, their influencers are a different set of people. So from the, from the perspective of, of, of the system, they're hard to find because we keep doing the same thing over and over again. But if we think about who the influencers are in these communities, be they faith-based leaders or in some cases, you know, strong alumni networks. Uh, in some cases, they are um, youth leaders in the community. You know, they, we, we just need to take the time to identify who is it that these folks are listening to, who is it that they look up to, and utilize those voices and those platforms for the purposes of improving the health of those communities that they're in, going back to population health. This, you know, I think population health folks are some of the most creative geniuses out there because they have to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it's very related to what we've seen during the pandemic um, with the push for uh, vaccination. It's uh, who's who's communicating with different uh, groups, who are their influencers. And that's a really important uh, concept. But you are also right to uh, population health management uh, uh Professionals are hard, very innovative. Um, so with that said, I'd like to, you know, ask a, a last a, a question here. Um, and again, I really appreciate your time. Answers are very clear and helpful. If from a, a policy perspective, a broad and we can look at federal or state, um, do you see anything that's a, a, a low hanging fruit uh, that could really drive this agenda forward and help us achieve uh better outcomes as we move forward for cardiovascular disease patients? Yeah, I I think, you know, I think, of course, when we think about policy, we think about what gets funded uh, in terms of services. And it's always a struggle. You know, there's a there's a very high threshold for deciding and determining what gets funded. And I would say that one of the reasons we're seeing this plateau in, in outcomes is in good outcomes is that these other support services um, or allied health services aren't being covered like cardiac rehab, like peer support um, or training to um, to increase and improve uptake of support services. You know, there are I, I want to commend a lot of our um, insurance providers and, and, um, and, you know, public health providers in all of the programming that they, they've got out there for improving access, but nobody knows about them. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows about them. So we have to do better in making sure that they are, you know, better advertised. Um, We need to take, you know, take a page from the book of of advertisers and marketers when Mm -hmm. thinking about how to reach out to communities. You know, there are lots of folks who are really successful in reaching these communities. Again, we need to think about how to utilize um, their strategies in, in this outreach and using good in market information to reach them. Yes, I, it, that makes a complete sense uh, from my perspective. And Selena, I think you have uh, hit on something that uh, Dr. McClellan uh, in, during our panel also uh, really highlighted, which was the need to get scale out of these efforts. Yeah. Um, and to get scale means improved communication because the solutions, it sounds like you're saying many of the solutions are there, but uh, we need uh, better reimbursement to, for some uh, some of them in, in, in yes. many instances and then better communication to ensure uptake and, and we can start pushing that um, that uh, that number back down. 
Um, so, Selena, it's been a, a real pleasure speaking with you uh, today. Again, I uh, really appreciate your time and, and clarity on, on responses um, and the effort that uh, you and um, Women Heart are putting in uh, to uh, improving access and, and the outcomes of, of the patients that you're working with. So thank you very much. Thank you. To wrap up today's program, we are joined by Representative Linda Sanchez, who serves California's 38th Congressional District. Hi everyone, I'm Congresswoman Linda Sanchez from Southern California. Thank you for joining today's virtual discussion. As we've heard from leading experts and healthcare professionals, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. It costs our healthcare system $216 billion annually and results in $147 billion worth of lost productivity each year. These statistics are alarming and only worsened as the COVID-19 pandemic upended our day-to-day -day lives. Due to necessary public health measures, it's been harder for Americans to manage their health. Preventive services, medical care, and treatment options for a broad range of health needs, including cardiovascular disease, were disrupted, disrupted and delayed. Routine care is critical because we know that up to 80% of heart conditions are preventable and appropriate management and treatment of cardiovascular disease can reduce the risk of serious heart events down the line. That's why it's critical for innovators, medical professionals, patients, and policymakers across all levels of government to come together to develop and advance solutions that meet our nation's current needs. I'm proud to stand with you in recognizing the urgency for action. Congress has taken steps to expand access to the continuum of care from preventive care to treatments that will help Americans manage their heart health and live healthier lives. Most recently, I was proud to help pass the American Rescue Plan, which provided new financial assistance to help Americans access quality health insurance. In Congress, I will continue my work with my colleagues to provide robust funding for prevention and research programs that lead to better health outcomes. But as we heard here today, there is much more for us to do to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease on individuals, families, and our economy. Events just like this one help us put us on the right track. I wanna thank our sponsors, Novartis and CQ Rocall, and our panelists for your willingness to come together to work together toward a healthier future. Thanks so much. That's all the time we have today. I'd like to extend the last thank you to all of our speakers, to all of you who have tuned in today, and to our sponsor, Novartis. Enjoy the rest of your day.